Hi, everyone. Hi, David. Okay, so I guess we'll just get started. Back in let's see, 2014 or 15, I think, I was working at the Law Library at Georgetown, and we were contacted by somebody from the DC Council's office who was interested in preserving the results of a project they were doing for putting the DC code online. And they were wondering if some of the tools that we were using might be the appropriate place to preserve it, which at the time they were not. But that's how I was introduced to the idea, this idea that Washington, D.C. had an interesting setup as far as its legal code goes and that it created interesting opportunities and challenges. Uh, a little while later, I became involved in digital preservation of legal code with a, a working group from people all over the place. And through that group, I met David Grayson. And we've talked several times about what he's doing. It's a really interesting project. And he had explained to me at one point in time how what they're doing, how it relates and is different from blockchain. And so when we were talking in this group about blockchain for preservation, I thought about David and thought about some interesting perspective he might have in terms of the project that he's doing, first of all, which in and of itself is, is really interesting, but also about blockchain. So uh, he very graciously agreed to speak to us today. So David is the founder and CEO of the Open Law Library, which um, is creating tools to do this kind of work. And I'm not going to try to represent it. So I'll let David talk more about it. So David, do you want to share your screen? Yes, I will. Okay. Well, maybe I can start uh, before going into, so I prepared some, some information for everybody about cryptography and preservation. So a little bit broader than just uh, blockchain, blockchain being, being one technology and that can be cryptographic technology that can be used for preservation. Um, so before we get into that, I guess I could just talk a little bit about Open Law Library and what we're do what we've been doing with DC and how we, how we got involved in all of this. Um, while we wait for screen share. Sure, that uh, would be great. So Open Law Library started in 2015, I guess. Um, yeah, we're almost five years old, time flies. Um, and it started when we, when I was introduced to Dave Zvenich, who was the former GC of uh, uh, the council in DC. And they were trying to figure out how to uh, publish their code electronically. They were having a lot of difficulty uh, doing so with, uh, with Lexis and other, uh, and other legacy publishers. Um, and so we, we worked with them basically from 2016 to today, building out all the different pieces that would be needed to digitally publish their code. Um, and when Lexis was doing it, they would have a bunch of people sitting in the bowels of Lexis just copying and pasting and uh, performing all the instructions that the that the that the law said needed to be performed on the code. Um, I guess quick question: How many people have law backgrounds? Is this mostly uh, on the digital preservation side? Is my understanding is that is that correct? Yeah, this is primarily digital. Well, the focus is digital preservation. So I don't know how many people. Uh, have a law library background. So okay. a little context would probably be great. Yeah, so screen the, sharing's on. Oh, excellent. Thank you. All right. Can people see the Yeah, that's great. So yeah, with with the law, every time you pass a law, it's usually either creating new law or amending existing law. And that that existing law is usually some compilation of many, many amendments before it gets back to its organic or to original law. And so you just have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of changes to this body of law over, over time. 
uh, when you're talking about potentially centuries worth of worth of changes. Uh, one of the things that Leia helped us do was build uh, or was get get a bunch of laws from going back to the 13th century uh, in England because there are a bunch of those old laws codified in the DC code. Uh, and so those are all up on the on the DC law library now. And since this is constantly changing, um, keeping track of when the, what the law was at a particular time became very difficult. And it took a lot of manpower to keep the law updated. And so we built out this infrastructure to uh, allow a single attorney in DC to do the work that all of Lexis was doing. Um, and to also, it also keeps track of how things change over time rather than just seeing the snapshot when, when a new publication is made uh, three times a year. Um, so, and that's what we were doing. Uh, we, we got interested in, and introduced to Leo when, uh, when it became clear that DC was interested in moving to fully, uh, a fully digital code at some point in the future, which would mean that they would need to uh, comply with ULMA, the Uniform Electronic Legal Materials Act, uh, which is a model code that was adopted by DC, uh, I guess two years ago now and that requires that L laws be preservable, authenticatable, and accessible in perpetuity. Um, basically the same as, as paper, paper laws. Any, any paper laws, librarians know how to preserve, authenticate, and make them accessible. There are real concerns as we move to digital only laws that we'll be able to do the same with, with them. Right. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop, I'd like this to be Inter as interactive as a Zoom call can ever be. <laughs> um, so if anybody has any any questions, I can stop after every slide and just, and if that is too awkward, I can, we can wait until the end. Okay. So today I want to talk about cryptography and preservation. Um, and as I was mentioning with Uelma, this is where in the legal field, this is very much where we're coming from. Uh, preservation, access, and authentication are all intertwined uh, because preserving digital laws that we cannot actually authenticate doesn't, doesn't help us. So if we get 30, 40 years from now or 100 or 200 years from now and we have all these digital files floating around that we don't have we don't actually know their provenance, then it's going to then it we could have some some serious issues, um, and then it's it's not helpful to have all these in in cold storage on tape. Uh, the law needs to constantly be available. As I said, we we have laws that are currently in force in in the district that are from the 13th century. So all three of these things are. Um, are very much intertwined. Sorry, yes, code is very much, uh, I'll keep this open in the corner so I can. Uh, code is very much overloaded in our little corner <laughs> of the internet. Uh, I was speaking about a legal code at that moment, um, but one of the things that we are concerned with is how do we preserve the digital data that represents that code for long periods of time. And we've sort of taken as our benchmark like 30 to 40 years as if we can, if we can have our, have everything still working 30 or 40 years from now, uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good goal. Uh, and then that'll give us time to, to figure out the next step. So I wanted to go a very non-exhaustive list of some of the existing sort of solutions for, for dealing with this. Um, at, at the most basic, we can store things locally and keep some backups on, on drives elsewhere and keep our hash lists. And 
uh, periodically check our hash lists on each of our each of our copies, and we hope that uh, we have our hash lists fully duplicated. And if we're if we're thorough about it, we're comparing our hash lists across all three of our copies to make sure that the hash list itself hasn't been corrupted. And then we're checking our hash list against the uh, and, and then we're checking our hash list against the actual contents of each of our three copies. Uh, and and repairing the data over time. Um, and then, and so that's usually within a single organization. Um, and then we have ways of sharing information between organizations uh, that more gets to some of the authentication where uh, people basically trust uh, portal aggregate, aggregators and portals like Hein Online to uh, properly vet and basically give it give them provide a chain of of continuity uh, for for material shared between institutions. Uh, and so when you get it on high online, you you trust that when they say that it came from a university on the other side of the country, that it in fact did come from that university, and it is uh, the document that the university uploaded. Which it isn't really, because Hein Online does a lot of uh, of changes to files to make it easier to to share. They'll often re OCR things, and over time, as technology improves, so you're you're there, therefore hoping that they haven't meaningfully changed changed the document. Um, and then we have things like locks. Uh, lots of copies keep stuff safe. I think. Um, where that's a distributed peer-to-peer uh, -peer file system uh, that manages a lot of these these uh, these issues. Uh, they they keep the I believe they do they do the the parity checks and all that, and they make sure that copies are are spread across multiple jurisdictions. Um, but their authentication is still. My understanding last last time I was speaking with someone about this and reading about them is that it's still basically you hope that the stuff that you that is on locks is in fact what people say it is. So now we get to the the fun the fun cryptographic stuff, um, and so I wanted to just talk about three today. There's blockchain. IPFS, which is the international uh, interplanetary file system, and TAF, which is what Open Law Library has built, the archive framework. So blockchain first. Block I love this quote. I think I shared it. Uh, blockchains are like grappling hooks in that it's extremely cool when you encounter a problem for which they're the right solution, but it happens way too rarely in real life. Um, the blockchains solve a very, very specific sort of problem, and they almost never, uh, you almost never meet that sort of real, that sort of problem in real life. In fact, nobody's yet found, found such a solution except for cryptocurrency. So, can I pop in with a question? Sure. So, um, hi, David. This is uh, Nathan Tallman. Um, about blockchain, and now I'm realizing you're about to start a second slide on blockchain, so I, I apologize if I'm uh, preempting something you were going to say. Um, but when you talk about you know, blockchain not necessarily uh, being useful in all the cases you think it is, it's just you know, you're, it's a hammer and you've, you see nails, um, is that a specific in implementation? Um, is, you know, I've been reading about sort of um, centralized versus decentralized and permissioned versus non-permissioned instances of blockchain and some that even have um, sort of interdependent um, aspects to it. So there's, there's the Archangel project out of the UK looking at blockchain for preservation. Um, the state of Vermont has done some research about doing legal transactions in blockchain. So I'm just wondering, is that a specific blockchain implementation you're referring to that doesn't have usage? 
Um, there's also actually a, a storage app called Starling coming up. Thanks. Sure. So, yeah, lots of people choose to call their technology, or at least certainly in the last four or five years, to call their technology blockchain uh, because it was a really hyped technology. Um, just like I remember uh, when I was in school, which is dating me, it was, it was all about microelectronic, electromechanical systems, MEMS, and everybody was redefining their stuff to be, to be MEMS. Um, so it's, it's a little difficult to, to figure out exactly what a blockchain is. Um, once you, once you if, you, if you define it very broadly as just a, a set of, uh, cryptographically signed blocks that uh, that also include a signature of all of, of the immediate parent, then that's not really a blockchain anymore. That that's uh, the the underlying technology is called a Merkle tree, which actually we will we will get to next. Um, blockchains are usually um, fully decentralized. Um, which then means that you have to figure out how to uh, trustless or, or fully trusted, um, how, how to allow people to decentralized, uh, write stuff to this decentralized ledger. And then, so figure out how to, how to let them write to the decentralized ledger and then figure out how to, um, how to resolve conflicts. And those are those are the two things that become very hard in any decentralized system. So maybe we can uh, step back and I can walk through what a blockchain is. And I'm going to go over very a, a very general overview of blockchain, uh, and then and then maybe we can I can answer some of those questions a little bit a little bit better. So. In a blockchain, you have a series of blocks and they form a chain via cryptographic hashes. Um, and so a cryptographic hash is where you take the data that you're interested in and through an algorithm, convert that data deterministically into a much shorter identifier. So you can take, and you can take an unlimited amount of data and turn that infinite amount of data into, uh, or arbitrary amount of data into a deterministic uh, identifier, deterministically sized identifier. Uh, so for instance, 256 bytes. Uh, it doesn't matter how large your original file is, it gets turned into 256 byte identifier that is unique to, if it's a cryptographic hash function, um, then it will, then only, that data will ever create that hash. If you're able to find two bits of, I mean, two pieces of data that both created the same hash, that's called a hash collision. And that means that your hash function is not cryptographically sound. Did that make sense or any questions about that? Okay. Um, and so in order to form the chain, what we do is we take the, the hash of the data that we care about, and we take the hash of the data of the previous uh, block in the chain, and we hash those two things together to get a new 256 uh, byte identifier. And that becomes the identifier for the block. And because the, that hash incorporates the hash from the parent, there is no way to modify any of the ancestors as long as you know that one descendant. And that's what creates the, um, the tamper resistant, one of the major tamper resistant benefits of a blockchain. The problem is that with a distributed ledger, which is what a blockchain, so a distributed data store that anybody can write to, anybody, as you can see here, you have a purple, after, after our root element, you add your first chain, your first block to the chain, 
and then two different people try to add um, a, a descendant to the chain at the same time. And since it's fully distributed, they might, there's nothing preventing them. In fact, there's no way for them to even know that the other person has done so. And so now we have two different chains and we have to determine which chain is the correct chain. Um, and that's, that's where most of the blockchain uh, work goes into, is figuring out how to reconcile conflicts where you have two different, two different branches. And the most uh, well-known way is with a proof of work where um, miners are basically spending immense amounts of money and electricity and CO2 to uh, do pointless calculations that can be cryptographic, that can be, that are very expensive to perform, but, but very easy to verify. And the first person to uh, basically uh, perform one of these calculations gets to write a block to the blockchain. And because it's very expensive to do this, um, you're able to force people into a consistent single chain at the end, right? Uh, and as long, whichever, whichever chain 51% of the miners have agreed is the actual chain, that's the official, the official record. At any point in time, if an attacker were to get more than 51% of, or more than 50% of the uh, computing power in this proof of work scheme, that person would be able to take over the, uh, the chain, do whatever they wanted. They could go back and modify history, do whatever they wanted, and people would know that something had happened, right? Because they might they might be you might be at this at this point in the block, and a a malicious uh, group is able to s split off from from this chain and go from there. Everybody might know what's happened, but there's nothing that can be done about it. Um, and then there are these other systems where you, where you as, as was talked about, where you have an authenticated bit, uh, blockchain where anybody can write to it once they're authenticated. Uh, the problem is that if you have a centralized authentication system, <coughs> which as far as, as I've been able to find most are, then you, you basically have a very ex expensive um, or very complicated uh, consensus mechanism with a single point of failure with your authentication. And so it, it sort of, it, it negates pretty much all the benefits of blockchain when you, when you start having a centralized uh, authentication scheme. And then there's some, some interesting stuff uh, in academia about um, trust-based as opposed to work, proof of work, so proof of trust. Um, <clears throat> but I have not seen any real world um, uses of that outside of academia. And I have not, I have not been able to wrap my head around how the proof of trust works. Uh, when I've talked to some, some people in the space, they've suggested that it might, might just be buzzwords. But if anybody is is has heard differently, please let me know. <laughs> does that sort of explain? Does that sort of answer the questions that you were getting at? Partly, but I don't want to waylay the presentation. Okay. Um, so I'll just keep going. Thanks. Okay, and I'm happy to talk more about it after afterwards. So a Merkle tree, when we talked about taking the hash of the data and the hash of the parent and hashing that to get a new, a new hash that uniquely identifies the parent, uh, that, is, that is a Merkle tree. Uh, it has no, a Merkle tree has no, so with a blockchain, we have this, this idea that there's going to be a single true path. With a Merkle tree, we don't care, right? All we care about is that this hash is of the 
of the parent and the uh, and there can be as many as many immediate children of a hash as you want. It just creates branches as opposed to a chain. And so that's why it's called a Merkle tree. And so a, a blockchain is built on top of a Merkle tree. Uh, and there are all of the benefits that we're talking about with, uh, with blockchain of the difficulty of, um, of amending it in the future, or in uh, difficulty of modifying the past. Uh, uh, we get all of those benefits with a Merkle tree, um, but we don't have to worry about the conflict resolution because there there is no conflict resolution. Everything everything is there, um, and we we push the conflict resolution to to be dealt with via some other mechanism. Is that is that sort of make sense so far? Any questions about that? It's hard not doing this in person. It's tough when you can't see people's faces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I will, I will hope that we're good. So the next two, the next two uh, projects that I'm going to show you are both built on Merkle trees. Uh, IPFS is a very well uh, financed start run by or being built by a very well financed startup. I think they got 270 million worth of uh, worth of money in 2017 from VCs. Um, and what they're trying to do is create a globally addressable data space uh, using URLs and URIs. And it's, but rather than just being a URL or URI that is uh, a static, so you can only see what's there right now like is the case with the current web, uh, World Wide Web. You go to a, if you go to a particular uh, domain like AALL's website, you only see the American Association of Law Librarians website as it appears today. You'd have to go to some third party like uh, the Internet Archive Wayback Machine in order to actually see what it looked like, hoping, hope, hoping that they actually scraped it at the time period that you cared about. And, and then you would again just be taking the you know, archives word for it that what they have is is what uh, was there at that time. Uh, IPFS uses this idea of the Merkle chain to store every single version of the the web of data that's stored in IPFS over time. Um, and then they've developed a crypto coin called Filecoin. Um, that, so instead of doing meaningless work, uh, cryptographic work to prove that you are, that you're warming our climate, uh, you are actually doing useful work and storing data on a hard drive in return for coins. And so they've been working hard to figure out how to prove that the data is in fact stored on your, on your hard drives and you're, that you're making it available and all this stuff. Um, it's a, a very hard problem that they have taken on um, and they are still working on it. I don't think that everything is up and running yet. It wasn't as of like two or three months ago when I last checked. Any questions about IPFS? And so what we've been working on is something called the archive framework. And we built it very much from the standpoint of uh, Okay, yeah, so you can definitely like spin up an IPFS node. Um, so I'm just looking at the yeah, so you can you can definitely spin up an IPFS node, uh, but it it is it's definitely not for the faint of heart right now, <laughs> um, or at least it wasn't a couple of months ago when I when I last tried. There were it was definitely still a lot of uh, of rough edges. But if if you've tried it, it's possible that they are. I mean, I know that they're working hard on it to to smooth everything out. 
so what we've been trying to do is build something that that basically mimics how libraries and publishers worked in the paper in the paper world um, for legal legal data where a publisher would work with the the jurisdiction to collect and update the laws as they were passed uh, usually in batches a couple of times a year um, and then libraries would subscribe to updates to those legal codes um, and the publisher would send an official code to the library to every library that requested it and then every time there was an update they would send they would send the pocket parts or the or the supplements as as needed uh, and over time a library some libraries would choose to just keep the most current and some would keep all of those historical pocket parts and, and supplements so you could theoretically go back and assemble the code as it was at a particular date. And the library is confident that the, uh, that the law is official because they received it from the official publisher. Um, the, and so we've been, we've built a system with that in mind. So it's not truly peer to peer. There are, it's, it's, there are publishers who are publishing legal data and different publishers are going to be publishing le different legal data and each publisher is responsible for um, the authenticity of the data that they are publishing and so they have a they each receive uh, smart cards that they use to sign their data um, and i shouldn't say receive because anybody can go out and buy, buy a smart card and start up a publication uh, using the, uh, the archive framework and uh, publish it to GitHub. And then anybody else can go on and download it, authenticate it, and, and, and save it. So we've, are people familiar with Git or should I discuss discuss Git. Um, Is there anyone who, if, if, if you raise your hand, if you'd like uh, David to talk more about Git. It looks like we're good, David. Okay. So Git is built on a, on a Merkle tree. And so we get all the, uh, all of the benefits of, of not having the data, uh, of having immutable data. Um, and the, the issue is then, and it also is a peer-to-peer -peer network, some, similar to locks. Um, and so what you do is you publish the data in a Git repository, and then there's a special authentication repository um, that aggregates as many Git repository, other Git repositories as you want. And create sort of a super Git repository that is signed uh, using something called the Update Framework, which is a cryptographically secure framework that's developed by uh, NYU Secure Systems Lab, uh, trying to solve the problem of how do we distribute uh, software uh, code and software binaries uh, all over the world, despite uh, lots of people wanting to. Uh, have have fake data attack that uh, attack that update mechanism and so a lot of large projects like python and uh, go and rust are all adopting the update framework to standardize how they secure the distribution of updates to to software and so we've taken that uh that framework, which itself forms another Merkle tree, and and applied it to the law. And what's cool about this is that it means that we don't have to anymore rely on uh, like public key infrastructure, um, and so you don't have to go and buy a, a certificate and have someone else attest that that certificate belongs to you. Um, 
in order to have it show up in Microsoft or in Adobe as from the District of Columbia. Because 20 or 30 years from now, that certificate uh, authority might no longer be be around, right? And so there's no way to for them to attest that that certificate was authentic back in 2000 or 2020 or whatever. Uh, what we do is we create a completely self-contained repository with uh, with the keys, and once a new version is signed with those keys, then and you and you download the updates from Git and authenticate it then uh, you no longer have to, you, you don't have to, it's, com sorry, step back a moment. Uh, it is, I'm sorry, I'm getting, so you have, <laughs> you have a set of, of keys uh, that are maintained by uh, by administrators within the agency or within the government. So for instance, in DC, it's the general counsel and the secretary of the council and the CTO of the council. And those people are what we call attesters. And they each have a YubiKey mm -hmm. and they each attest that the, that the codification council in the, in the district, his, his key, his uh, cryptographic certificate is the one that is allowed to publish laws in, in the district. And if at some point he leaves the council, those three attesters would, would basically, or, or a majority of them would attest to a new key for the new, uh, the new uh, codification council. And, and in this way, if, if one of those attesters leaves, uh, say the secretary of the council retires and they get a new secretary of the council, then the other attesters would then attest to the new secretary's certificate. And this allows you to basically have internal, uh, internally consistent set of keys that are robust over time to loss of keys or theft of keys or personnel turnover. All these things that the public key certificate system was set up to uh, to handle. And you have to do one out of band authentication, basically to say, is this in fact the root, the root node? So if we go back to the, to the Merkle tree, you have to, you have to find out what is the, the top hash, that root hash. And for that, you'd, as a library, when you decide to, um, to start publishing or to, to provide the DC code to your patrons, you would have to call up to the DC council and confirm over the phone. So out of band, out, out of band, the root hash. And once you've done that, then everything going forward, every time they publish a new, a new supplement, you down, the system downloads it, authenticates it, and you're done. You never have to do another out of band authentication again. It doesn't matter how much personnel turnover there is, whether keys change because the publisher uh, codification council has left and a new one has come in, that is all managed internally. And once that library has that, um, then over time, if sometime in the future, say 20 or 30 years from now, uh, DC is no longer using this system, as long as there are a number of libraries that have that all have copies of the DC code uh, in, this, in this format, as long as they can all agree on what that top hash is, that root hash is, then they will all know that they have authentic, authentic versions. And that is the system that we have been building. And so that was, that was to address the uh, access, uh, preservation, and authentication all all together. That's required by UELMA. Yeah, it's required by the yeah Uniform Electronic Legal Materials Act. Right. So, so I guess questions. Anyone?
it's um, really interesting the way the um, project has been set up here. And, and in some ways, um, you know, cryptography can be a way to shift trust from institutions to technology. But this seems to balance both institutional um, and cryptographic trust um, with the approach here. It seems um, pretty pretty flexible. Maybe onboarding might be a tricky um, for a new library joining the uh, um, framework here with the tough authentication. But just it's really interesting. Thank you for sharing. And that was very much one of the things. That was one of. Let me share this. Uh, this is, I think, the best workflow that I've seen for whether to use blockchain. Um, and it's from, I think, DHS. The, the reason why we don't need blockchain, at least in the legal publishing space, is because the, the trust comes directly from the government. Uh, I think one of the things that I, heard, that I read, which I think is really a good point, is that the government doesn't need blockchain because the government is able to say by fiat what is and what is not. Um, the, the government can use a Merkle tree to keep itself honest, but using a blockchain doesn't make sense for most government and government adjacent work because there is no, there is no question of what is, what is authoritative. There doesn't need to be. Um, what we're worried about are situations like um, uh, when Russia goes in and tries to go back and, and manipulate your historical laws or your, your existing laws. Um, that wasn't Georgia that they did that in. It was um, one of those so former Soviet countries where they just were messing with everything. Uh, and they, they've switched to a, a, uh, a system similar to what we've, what we've developed. Um, and so, yeah, what we're, what we're trying to do is make it possible to, for outside entities, outside of government, to know what was government's intent at any time, no matter how far in the future, which is a, a slightly different problem than, than what I think blockchain is trying to solve. Does anyone have any questions um, about sort of the intersection of legal code um, and preservation um, in terms of this interesting um, way that legal code is published and, and the challenges of versioning and preservation of the entire process? Um, I don't know, David, if it's useful at all to to pull up the um, DC code to, to take a look at it. Sure. Uh, or if anyone has any questions about what the actual um, mechanism is for publishing that online, that is the front end of everything that David's talking about. Yeah, so here's an example of the, of the English law. I think you um, are, I'm still seeing your, your um, slides. Oh, you're not able to see. Hmm. I must have just shared one page. Let me see if I can switch it to. Okay. I'm sorry. So you guys weren't able to see the uh, that uh, right. that yeah. flow flow chart. Yep. So this is yeah. This is the Homeland. I think it's Homeland Department of Homeland Security flow chart. Um, uh -huh. And so here's here's for example relatively recent English law that Georgetown helped us get. Thank you, Pam. And Here's the code over time. Let me actually show you uh, San Mateo. We have a little bit more history. Um, so we can go to something like ordinance number 2019-13, 
which makes a ton of changes to the San Mateo code. Uh, you can see that um, here it was repeat it repealed the section. Uh, and so over time, I mean, but if I if I cared about what this law was um, prior to uh, in say 2018, I'd want to be able to go back in time and see how that was modified. And so because we have full history, we're able to provide you with a, a diff of exactly what the, what the law was at that time, or we can actually just go back and see what it was on April 5. And what, we, what we're particularly proud of is the fact that all of the URLs are, are basically permalinks. So seeing this, this URL will always take you to whatever the code was on 2018.04.05. Uh, it doesn't matter how it changes. And we, could, we could put in any date up here um, and it will, it will show you exactly what the what the code was regardless of um, regardless of what it is today. And if we we switch to current, then this is no longer a true permalink because it will show you whatever the code is currently. And and your underlying format is XML, right? Yes. So if we go to uh, There's a whole set of repositories, uh, each one doing a different thing. So here's the raw XML. Uh, here's the, the XML after it's been codified. Uh, and then here's HTML generated from the XML. And so you can actually download this, this repository here, um, run server.exe and get the full website running locally. Uh, all this is from the, the preservation stuff. And on, once on the preservation you've, side. yeah, once you set this up, um, the, the, the people in the offices are able to, to do all of the updating, correct? Exactly. Yeah, this is all, all managed by, uh, well, it depends on the jurisdiction. So the city of San Mateo didn't want to deal with it, so they just have us do it. Oh. But uh, DC council, does it all themselves. Um, theirs is a much larger repository. Um, but yeah, we can we can go to DC Law XML and we can go to their commits. I think it was just there. Where they've changed their uh all right, yeah. So here you can see B Bryant DC Council has been making all these changes to, to the DC code. Pretty much every day he's on there publishing new laws. Um, and if we go go here to releases, here you can see uh, the official the official releases every time he he actually releases something. And those releases are basically saying this: the repository is now in a in a in a state that is uh, that's good to go, but it still has all of the correct history in it. So does anyone have any questions about any of this? We've got uh, a couple in the chat. Um, yeah. Let's so I see. Was, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'll just say mine. I was curious if you've had any reaction or pushback from, from legal publishers. Um, I think there was a court case not long ago about republishing legal code and whether or not LexisNexis or Westlake had the legal right to it. So I was curious. Yeah, so we, we have, I think we're still small enough that uh, people are hoping that we will go away. <laughs> also, that lawsuit in Georgia was about, um, it was about annotations. The law itself is, is generally not copyrightable, but some of these legal publishers create um, annotations and advisement on the law, and that's what uh, 
they were claiming copyright of and the case was a, because you can't really separate them and Georgia's legal code, their actual official code uh, included these annotations. That, that was why this was uh, an interesting court case where, and um, it was ruled that the publishers, that, that a state could not uh, lock up its legal code even though it had this material from legal publishers on it, which in my opinion is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whereas what we're doing is we're actually replacing the legal publisher working directly with the jurisdiction and then instead of trying to claim a bunch of copyright blocking everything behind terms of service, we put it all up on GitHub for free. And it's the actual code. You don't deal with annotations or anything like that, right? Uh, well, no. So the, the DC code does have many, many annotations. Um, but it's by D, by DC, or is exactly. it's not by any other legal publisher? Correct. It's it's yeah. by it's by DC. Yeah. But if if someone wanted us to do uh, do those, we'd be happy to do them. They yeah. would just have to pay for it, and that's that's what as as with most things, that's what it all comes down to is that Lexus was doing a ton of work that the George that Georgia that the state of Georgia was requiring them to do to fulfill the contract. Right. And then Georgia was saying, we're not gonna pay you for any of this work, but you can keep the copyright and sell, sell the work that we're requiring you to do. And that's how you're gonna recoup your money. And yeah. what the court said was, no, if you're going to require them to do all this work and you're going to make it part of the official code, so you can't, you can't look at the official code without looking at the annotations, um, then those annotations can't be copyrighted by the, by the codifier, which was absolutely the right decision. Yeah. If like Westlaw probably, Westlaw is not the official codifier. They have a Westlaw annotated, Georgia code annotated. They still have all the copyright and all of their annotations right. because they're not the official codifier. They're not and then, really at the behest of, of the Georgia legislature. We have a question from Daniel. To what extent is the normalization of legal changes into the standardized format automated slash automatable? So I would say that right now it's about 30% automated, 20% automated. Um, we think that it can probably get up to 80, 85% automated. Um, we very much take a sort of Iron Man approach to automation. Um, where we build software to enhance a lawyer's abilities. Um, the, just like Iron Man suit doesn't make decisions for Iron Man. Iron Man is making, where Tony Stark is making all the decisions of what happens and it's just automated, augmented and automated once he makes that decision. Uh, that's exactly how we're doing it with our system. We have uh, uh, integrated development environment built specifically for codification attorneys that provides autocomplete and contextual uh, and jump to jump to uh, definition and all these things that they need to be able to do their work very very quickly um, and we're now working to um, provide better autocomplete so when you start when 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 they want to type in and when they want to enter an annotation, it will automatically fill in the annotation, the codification instruction with um, what the the neural net thinks is the uh, is the correct uh, codification instruction, and the human makes the decision whether that is in fact the case. And the human, so there's always a human in the loop. I would think there would be a considerable pushback if you went much further only because of uh, the chances of something technologically introducing something incorrect into the whole system. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, and that's, that's where a lot of, of people who have tried to go this route have, have run aground is they're technologists who are like, well, we got it to like 90, 93%, even Google does this with their, uh, yeah. with their legal research tools. It's like, it's at, it's like, 
87, 85%, that's good enough, right? It's like, <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. So we have a comment also, let's see, a couple notes related to blockchain and digital preservation to pass along. So everybody should take a look at that if you're interested in, in all of this and there's some links to, to go off to. This will all be saved also in the, in the meeting uh, notes and, and things like that. So if you don't get it now, you can go back to the notes later. Well, we're just about at time. So uh, David, I wanna thank you so much for being willing to come and talk to us. Every time I talk to you, I retain a little bit more about <laughs> the technology of all of this. It's a little brain stretching, at least for me. So I'm very grateful for you coming and talking to us. My pleasure. And there's a, uh, up on AALnet is the uh, Open Law Library white paper for the DC uh, if people are interested, maybe I'll put this into the chat. If that will be yeah, that would be great if you could do that. So I I'm not sure that we have a def definitive topic for our next meeting next month, but we have a couple of different uh, possibilities. So once we know what that's going to be, we'll include that in a message. Hopefully by the time I get the um, YouTube for this meeting all set up, then we'll have that information. I'll include it in that. Uh, message going out. So thanks everybody. We will see you uh, in August. Bye-bye. Thanks again, David. Thank you. Bye.